identify this airplane. We'll wait. No, we won't. Well, hello, Glue Troopers. Max and Max's models here. We got a lot to talk about tonight, so let's get rolling. A longtime Glue Trooper and channel contributor, uh, Chris Pacer, mentioned today that he had just uh, started finishing up uh, Monogram 148 scale SBD, Douglas Dauntless. And I thought about it, and I was thinking, you know, that might be the kit I've built more times than any other. The thing's been around since the 60s, and although it's gone through a bunch of reboxings, it's still available today, and not a lot has changed. Now, I'm not counting the current 148 scale Revell SBD-5 that's in production, because that's essentially, I believe, an Italeri repop, which was, I think, a modification of the old Accurate Miniatures model. So I'm talking about the actual relatively straightforward uh, Douglas SBD from monogram even though it's currently today sold as Revell, and it has a little dropping bomb and openable flaps retractable gear but i had just thought about it and especially since i did that battle of midway video i built several of them for that along with a bunch of uh, avengers which i might have built as many avengers as dauntlesses but i think i built more dauntlesses because i built it several times as a kid no matter how it was boxed, I always loved that kit, and I built several of them uh, that were the old little Hawk kits, little 172nd scale ones. It's just kind of a timeless design, and I think it's one of the greatest planes of World War II. Definitely a workhorse airplane. And uh, it got me wondering, what kit have you built the most times? So that was uh, kind of cool. So after that, uh, in the daily chores, I got cracking on the Stukas. And boy, do we have a lot to talk about there. First off, the big one 30-second scale reveal kit, uh, you know, scraping the flash off, not the greatest fits. And I got the cockpit painted and finished. And you're really not going to be able to see the detail that much because of something that happened later. But I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So... I got a lot of the this little stuff done, the tires painted and the bombs put together and propeller put together, things like that. The fuselage and cockpit and all went together pretty well. It was pretty straightforward. Fitting the engine took a little bit of wiggling, but where the real trouble kicked in was with the cowling. Uh, but let's come back to that. Once I got the uh, model clamped down, I went out to the Tarbis or as I now call it, the post-hurricane Tarvis. And I, I took the 148 scale uh, mo Pro Modeler Stuk out there with me, and I was going to go ahead and clear coat the acrylic parts for both airplanes. So first thing I did was uh, test my clear coat. Sometimes I use just floor wax, but this time I thought I would go ahead and uh, use either lacquer or enamel. So I got an old piece of clear plastic I didn't need and test shot the enamel it fogged it up even though it said clear so i'm not using that i also had some pearl some clear and some flat uh, lacquers from tamian of course i wasn't going to use the flat so i tried just the regular clear looked good so i went ahead and used it on the acrylic parts to the stukas and then much to my horror some spots in it fogged a little bit not where i can't use them but if i pose the airplanes with the canopies closed you're not going to be able to see the inside that well, but I really didn't hyper detail the insides. It just did your usual, you know, gray and black interiors with uh, the um, brush, dry brushing of the panels and stuff to make them pop a little bit, a few colors. Not a whole lot to see in there. So I'm not panicked about that, but just kind of annoying. Now I had to stop here and let all this harden before I could mask the canopy. So it's back into the office, back working on the big Stuka. And the wings were not hard to put together, but those uh, flaps and ailerons that hang separately, when I put them on, everything looked like it was fitting right. But when I put the um, actuator arms on them, they didn't line up. I had to push the flaps further back. So I was like, hmm, that's, uh, that's something to be, you can put them in the wrong position. And so you have to use those actuator arms as sort of guides to how far back they should go. 
and it was some tricky clamping and stuff to get it to not over pressure the kit but hold in place and eventually i got it all done got all the accoutrement on it um then other things for the day and then it was back out to the tarbis to uh start uh masking the canopy for the 148 scale model and got it on and of course i uh, was able to prime the uh model and uh that that went without a hitch and let that harden. When I came back, uh, I'd had just enough of the Luftwaffe light blue to do the underbelly. And uh, then I was able to uh, put the, once that hardened, I was able to go over, mask it off and start the dark green, which will, uh, then the lighter green will go on in the zigzag camouflage pattern after this. So we got all that done. And right now the Big wings of the Stuka have pretty much uh, hardened and they look like they're ready to be mounted to the airframe now. And I'm probably going to do this one in desert camo. I'm obviously doing the smaller one in the uh, European camouflage. And that's where we're at with that. But I was a, a little surprised at uh, just how much argument I got out of the uh, flaps on the big one. Um, on the 148 scale pro modeler, the main thing was it was just very difficult to mask off that canopy, which uh, one thing I did because it's a lot of people say, oh, just burnish it down. You can see the framing and you can go over it with a pencil, you know, and that'll show the highlights of the edges. Nah, this is, they're too subtle. So what I did was I actually used a, a black uh, marker to mark the framing so I could see where to cut. And it's not going to be a thing of beauty, but it'll look okay on the shelf. And as we all know, that's pretty much my standard. And somebody had said earlier, just just get the masks. They're worth it. And I tell you what, next time I'm going to do something like this, I think I'll just order a mask for it. it it's just getting those little tiny little wind curt windshield parts, no matter how good the tape is, it wants to move around on you. And I did use a brand new sharp uh, X-Acto knife blade. So uh, that's... Uh, that that's why believe it or not on the 170 second scale on a different academy i just got i think it was a toothpick or a super fine tip brush and just just hand painted it and you know it actually came out okay so and i'll probably wind up having to touch this one up when i'm done but at least there's a, a primer undercoat on it so the inside will be gray and um that'll help the the paint pop a little more so we'll see how it looks when i'm done that is where we're at for right now the mystery airplane that is an XAT-6E. Apparently during the war, there was some concern that uh, they wouldn't be able to get enough of the radial engines because they were so in demand. So they uh, had this uh, inverted V Ranger engine as an option, which actually performed a little bit better. They were used in air racing after the war, but uh, they were a real maintenance nightmare and they weren't considered as reliable as the radials. This particular one uh, wound up in private hands, and I, according to the FAA website, it was deregistered around 2017, but that doesn't mean it could have left the country or it could be in a museum or could mean anything. But pretty cool to see a T6 with a, basically a baby Messerschmitt engine in it, you know, a, an inverted V. <laughs> That's uh, something you don't see every day. Okay, guys, take care of yourselves. We'll talk at you later. And as always, model on.